Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Boardman Auditorium. I am John E. Boardman, who is the host of it. I started the Boardman Auditorium in the beginning of 2013, so I can speak to the world on the subject of life. I am by far no expert of anything, but I can be a guide for it. The things I say on my show are like applications that can be downloaded into people's mind for them to use as a way of being transformed daily. So welcome to the Boardman Auditorium. Welcome to the Boardman Auditorium. I'm your host, John E. Boardman, and I'd like to thank you guys for listening. For this episode, I will share how the evangelism began in Lynchburg. Every Friday from 1 to 3 o'clock p.m., a group of evangelists meet for some evangelism. So I hope the story of how we began will inspire you to share your faith with lost people. And we have lost people all around us. The bus stop ministry began in November of 2011. A friend of mine had a friend from Atlanta, Georgia. His name was Saki Arthur. He came to my friend and I one night at the bookstore, uh, Liberty University, and he was asking my friend about where's a good place to do some evangelism. Well. He ended up telling him that the bus stop between the plaza and the library is a perfect place for witnessing. So he asked my friend, and he asked me. My friend could not do it because he was obligated with work, but I was unemployed at the time, so I told him, yes, I would be interested to go to the city bus stop so we could do some witnessing. The following day, I did not know what to expect of witnessing at the bus stop. When I got there, we met in the library for a time of prayer. My friend Saki explained how we were going to do it, and we went from there. Saki took me to the bus stop, and he began to open-air preach while we handed out witnessing tracks and did one-on-one -on -one witnessing. That was a format of the bus stop. The person in this clip is not Saki, but someone else. But this is a clip I have. So the bus stop evangelism began in a time of prayer, open-air preaching, and witnessing. Well, after three years of evangelism at the bus stop, everybody knows that area as the Korean Outreach Ministry. As you can see in this clip, there are many people, especially Koreans. They come out every Friday, whether it's hot or cold, to do witnessing. They hand out water, tea, and items to be used as a way to win people for Christ. So the bus stop is known as the Korean Outreach Ministry. Hello once again, City of Lynchburg. It's a cold day, but our Heavenly Father has given us the sunshine so that we can enjoy His creation. This past week I had a wonderful opportunity to go to Richford Juvenile Center. But before I tell you about that, I'd like to tell you who I am. My name is John Boardman, and I'm a servant at Hope of Gold Church, and we have Pastor Derek here with us. So if you're looking for a new church to come, go ahead and check us out at Hope and Glow. We are located at Perrymont, and our service begins at 11 a.m. So we love for you guys to be out there so we can worship the Lord together. Now, this past week, I was at the Lynchburg Juvenile Center, and I got to share the gospel with a couple of kids. But I was not planning to speak, yet it was the Holy Spirit that called me up to share what God is about. 
And the statement I gave them is a powerful statement. It's a very powerful statement. And that statement is, God is love. Let me repeat that. God is love. Now, when I make that statement across, let's say, a person that doesn't believe in God, we identify that person as an atheist. A person would say, okay, if God is love, and let's say that he did create this world, then how come there's so much evil, so much suffering? I mean, you have war, you have famine, people are dying of diseases. We live in a world with pain and suffering. So how can you say God is love? To understand the statement, God is love, we have to flip to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verse chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's about God's creation and man being led by God into the Garden of Eden. You see, literally, God created the earth in six days. And the seventh day, he rested. And on the sixth day, he created man. And the way he created man is found in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, God begins to form mist out of the ground. And he takes the dust of the ground and he forms a human body. And in that human body, he breathes inside to give it life, to give a man a soul. You see, the difference between God's view and evolution view of the body is that God created a human body and gave it a soul. An evolution view of the body says that your body is nothing, is nothing but a matter in motion made of random chemicals. So that's why if you flip on your television, 90% of the commercials have to be about medicine and pharmaceutical companies. They believe that the best way to treat your ailment is through chemical and drug therapy. Where, in fact, instead of making the body better, the body gets worse. I'll give you an example. Medical doctors that's familiar with the cure to cancer believe that the best way to cure cancer is through radiation. Let me repeat that. The best way to cure cancer of the human body is through radiation. Now, radiation is a very harmful element that comes from the sun. And radiation destroys skin cells. That explains the reason why people get older and they wrinkle up faster. So if radiation destroys cells, and we need cells to heal our bodies, so why are we taking radiation? So people that are chemo end up dying permanently and very quickly. Now, if you look at the Bible, the body is a human being, and there's a soul inside of it. And throughout the Bible, God tells Adam and that's of mankind that the herbs of fuel are good for the body. All the things I created for the human body is meant for good. So, man says that the body is a matter of motion made of chemicals, and the best way to cure it is through drug therapy. The Bible says that God created man on a sixth day. The man is a body and a soul. You see, through that soul is how we function. That's where our thoughts lie, our emotions, and that's what tells the brain to tell the body to move a certain way. As you see, I'm moving right now because in my soul, I'm telling my body to go up and down, up and down, but sometimes the body responds is automatically. And to put everything together in its perfect unity takes an intelligent creator. Now, God, after he got finished creating man, he led him to the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was the most beautiful thing and beautiful places created at the time. And right now, there's nothing in this world that can create, can compare it to. Because after sin has entered into this world, sin rottens the earth. 
Now, when God created the Garden of Eden, I mean, imagine it. Imagine the the fresh, the freshest air you could possibly ever breathe, the freshest foods you could ever eat, and the freshest water that you could replenish your body. You see, when God created a fruit, Him being the Creator, did not need to add any preservatives. He didn't add any hormones to help it grow faster. This all came from Him. God is good. He is pure. He is holy. And also, the water. For God did not need to add any chemicals or additives to the water, for the water was pure. Everything, and everything else in the garden grew naturally. It was so beautiful at the time. And God led Adam into the garden. He led him to the garden and said, Adam, I want you to be in charge of this garden. And every fruit of the tree you could eat, but you could not eat the tree of knowledge. That command right there showed that man was under God's command. Now, somebody asked the question, well, why in the world did God create this world and man? Well, let me take some time to answer that so that way you can see that, yes, God is God and God is love. Well, you see, God had a wonderful plan for you and I. He created this world so he could share his glory with us. And he created us so that we can have eternal relationship to him, and so that we may freely express our love and willingly give what he wants from us. So if somebody asks the question, well, what does God want from humans? Well, what God wants from us is he wants real worship, real worship. Real worship is expression of our love towards God. God is love. Now, we live in our bodies and our souls are driving it. And the purpose of our bodies is to offer as living sacrifice to God. So that's what God wanted from human beings. But you see, God being all-knowing, he knew exactly what he needed to do in order to get real worship from us. So God gave us two attributes that he has. And those attributes are love and free will. Even though God knew that we would choose sin over righteousness, we would choose death over life, he still gave us free will. So God gave us free will, and he gave us law. And yet, you see the way God designed the soul to be satisfied it was through only through His love that could satisfy our soul. So God created Adam with love and gave Adam the free will to either obey Him or reject Him. Yet God was very clear to Adam that if he decided to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that he would surely die. So we go from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 2, and we go in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, it's about the fall of man. One day, Adam, with his wife Eve, was in the garden. While they were in the garden, the serpent, which they could put the form of body of, was wrapped around a tree of knowledge. And Satan is real. He is real as the ground I walk upon. Satan may seem like he's good. He may be like a person that you sympathize because he got kicked out of heaven. Yet don't be fooled. Satan is like a roaring lion. The only thing he cares about is to seek and destroy as many people's lives as possible and bring them down with them in a lake of fire. You see, once upon a time, Satan was an angel. And his name was Lucifer. And as God was creating, and he was building his relationship with humankind, Lucifer got jealous. And he deceived many angels that became fallen demons. And yes, we do have demons in this world. Well, Satan got jealous. 
And there was a war in heaven between him and Mike the Archangel. And Jesus witnessed that he said, I saw Satan fall from the sky. So Satan falls into this world. He lives in this world. And he's out to seek to destroy us. And the first person he saw to destroy was Adam. You see, the way the Bible describes Satan is that he's very cunning, he's very deceptive, he's powerful, he's very smart. So, he's smarter than our computers. Well, Satan wraps himself around a tree of knowledge. He's waiting for Adam and Eve to come by. And when they came by, Satan began tempting Eve by questioning God's authority and then twisting his word. And what Satan did was he tempted the eyes, the flesh, and the pride. Pretty much Satan offered them what he could not give them. He told them, hey, you know what? If you eat from this tree of knowledge, you won't surely die. And the reason why God's keeping you away is that he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like God himself. So the idea of secret knowledge and being like God satisfies the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of Eve and Adam. So Eve took the by the bite of fruit and passed it on to her son, I mean to her husband, Adam. As soon as they took that bite, they did not feel like God. In fact, they were ashamed. They were ashamed of what God created. So sin entered into this world, and after sin came death. You see, the reason why there's evil and suffering in this world is because of Adam's choice to disobey God. And so everyone that came after Adam inherit a sin nature, except for Christ. Christ was the promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Christ lived in this world for 33 years, and that was 2,000 years ago. Not only does the Bible reveal that Christ existed, but there's also historical documents that mention Christ, that he was the Messiah, that he was a teacher, and he lived among the Jews. Now, when people say that information, they come across and say that Christ, yeah, he might have existed, yet he's just a good teacher. Okay, if you make that claim of a good teacher, then would you say a person that lies, would that make them a good teacher? Now, think about that. People must come to the conclusion that Jesus is God or not. There's really no middle ground for it. So, Jesus being God. Jesus being God means that he is absolute and he cannot lie. And throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus claims that he is God throughout the chapter. So, either if Jesus is a good teacher, then he must be telling the truth. If not, he must be lying. So, we all need to examine God's will thoroughly and not let our minds lead us to the conclusion, but our heart. Now, Jesus being God's promise, being the Messiah. For well, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 states, For the wage of sin is death. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 3. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You see, God sent His only Son, Jesus, 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for our sins. And at that time, Jesus experienced the most agonizing and most painful death that one can experience. For Jesus was whipped with the cat of nine tails before He was led to Calvary. And the cat of nine tails basically was a whip. And the end of the whip, there was extensions of it that was split. And toward the end of those splits was spikes. So when Roman soldiers would whip the prisoners, the cat's tails would pierce the skin and they would hold on to it. And as the Romans pulled it back, they would be ripping skin apart. 
So this is what Jesus experienced before he went to the cross. And then when he went to the cross, they took his cross, they lied it down, and they lied him across. And they took three nails. One for his one for each of his wrists and one for his feet. And he nailed the cross. So God's expression to us of how much he loves us is through his son Jesus. So that's why God is love is a powerful statement.